My name is Dave Zwiefel. I'm the editor of the Capital Times, which is sponsoring this debate as a public service. I have with me tonight uh, one of our staffers, Susan Troller, and her husband, Howard Cosgrove, who will assist me. I want to thank you all for coming, and I'm sure the next two hours will be informative and contribute to our understanding about animals and research and allow us to formulate our own views on the subject. First, I want to emphasize that this is a debate aimed at giving vent to the two sides on this issue. I know that emotions over uh, animal research are high on both sides, but please let's be courteous to the people who have agreed to give of their time and spend the next two hours and enlighten all of us. And to, do th and to do that, we have with us two esteemed experts in their respective fields. First, Ray Greek, on my left and your right, who is president of Americans and Europeans for Medical Advancement, is here from California to argue his case. Dr. Greek, Greek an anesthesiologist and an expert in pain management, has written and co-authored with his veterinarian wife three books that argue that animal research is cruel and unnecessary. He has also authored several major pieces on the subject for major magazines and newspapers and is in demand throughout the country and globally to discuss animal research. We are indeed fortunate to have Dr. Greek here this evening. Next, Dr. Eric Sangren, on my right, uh, has dealt with this topic for years in his position at the UW-Madison's Veterinary School and his position as chair of the All-Campus Animal Care and Use Committee. He did his undergraduate work here at the UW. He got his veterinary degree and PhD in genetics at Penn and then joined the vet school here in 1993. In his research studying pancreatic and liver cancer, Dr. Sangren uses genetically modified mice. He is keenly knowledgeable on animal researchers and we indeed too are fortunate to have his participation here tonight. We will conduct this debate as follows. Dr. Greek will start off he will have 30 minutes to present his case. Then Dr. Sangren will have 35 minutes to give his side, and Dr. Greek will come back with five minutes of rebuttal. Following those presentations, we will spend the remainder of the time, approximately 45 minutes, on questions and answers. All members of tonight's audience are invited to submit written questions using the paper and, and pencils, I think, that were you received when you came in the door. And Susan and I will in turn uh, direct them, direct those questions to the two doctors. We will not take questions verbally from the floor. Doctors Greek and Sangram will each have two and a half minutes to answer the questions that you have asked. Neither debater will be allowed to interrupt the other. Susan and I will keep time and give warnings before cutting off either debater when, at the time that their time expires. And again, please be courteous, no matter how strong the feelings, no interruptions from the floor, which would only spoil our ability to hear the arguments. We will now proceed. Dr. Greek, you're first. Is my microphone working? Everybody hear me okay? Does everybody want to hear me? I think that's probably the, the more pertinent question. <laughs> Can you be heard in the back? Just raise your hand. So. Okay, good. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank the Wisconsin Historical Society for allowing this debate to be held in their auditorium. I'd like to thank the Capital Times uh, for sponsoring the event and uh, Dave Zwiefel for moderating. I'd like to thank Rick Vogel and the Alliance for Animals for organizing the event. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Eric Sangren for agreeing to participate. Eric, you did not have to do this, and I, I appreciate your participation. And finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank the National Anti-Vivisection Society, uh, whose generous grant allows Americans for Medical Advancement uh, to continue to function. Can everybody see the cartoon? Well, suffice it to say that uh, we're going to take the road to the left tonight and look at some unquestioned answers. Now, before I begin, I need to uh, set out some disclaimers. Number one, I cannot cover everything in one brief lecture. So please understand that there will be some necessary omissions. For the details and more information, 
I recommend the numerous references and books discussed on our website. Number two, I am not here to convince you of a concept that may be totally foreign to you. Rather, I am here to ask you to question some old assumptions. We have been taught from high school on that animals must be used to ensure the safety of drugs and discover the cause and cures of disease. We respect our teachers and our mentors like we should. And hence, it is difficult for us to question some of what they taught us. But in scientific pursuits, before a claim can be established, it must be proven. There are many instances of the scientific community accepting a concept that later proved false or rejecting one that later proved true. Usually, such mistakes were corrected because a few scientists stayed true to the scientific method and accepted the evidence regardless of the consequences. The paradigm of science demands skepticism and is anti-authoritarian. Opinion does not count. Evidence counts. Before accepting a concept, scientists expect to see evidence, usually in the form of supporting documentation from the scientific literature. I will list on my slides, as I'm sure Eric will, uh, references from the scientific literature supporting what the slide says. It is important to note that documentation, as is relevant to our discussion this evening, does not consist of anecdotes. One very impressive correlation, or even multiple correlations, between animals and humans is not scientific evidence of predictability. A multiplication of anecdotes does not equal evidence. It is still anecdotal. Rather, when trying to decide if a research modality, such as the use of animal models, is predictive for humans, one must produce data and studies that compare what the animal model revealed in many cases, many times, with what actually happened. For example, if one wishes to evaluate the animal model of testing drugs for their ability to cause heart attacks, one should look at drugs that caused heart attacks in humans and then look at the animal species that were tested and see what happened in them. If five animal species were tested and only one showed heart damage, it is incorrect to conclude that that animal model predicted heart attacks in humans. To focus only on one animal species in one test would be anecdotal. I will give examples of scientific evidence in my talk, and I will contrast that with anecdotes. On the other hand, proving a modality is not predictive is actually much easier, as sufficient scientific studies can invalidate a hypothesis, for example, that animal models are predictive for humans. Number three, I claim that animal models are not predictive for drug testing and disease research, and the predictability of animal models is the topic for tonight's debate. My organization and I do not deny that occasionally an animal will react to a drug or a disease in the same fashion as a human, but this is anecdotal. It does not imply predictability. Retrospective analysis will usually find an animal that mimicked human reactions to drugs or disease or whatever. But again, this is not the same as prediction. Retrospective prediction is an oxymoron. Now, obviously, animals can be used in many scientific pursuits, uh, some of which I have listed on this slide. And again, obviously, uh, humans and animals have things in common. And hence, animals have been used in the past for many things, such as to demonstrate the germ theory of disease, to demonstrate that blood flows in a circle, and to learn about very basic physiology. But that is not where science is today. Today we are studying humans at the level where the differences between species outweigh the similarities. Claiming past successes justify current use is like using a canoe to travel across the Pacific Ocean. Yes, it was done at one time, but today we use airplanes. 
And lastly, Americans for Medical Advancement is in favor of, is in favor of anything that leads to cures or safer drugs. If animal models were predictive, we would not oppose them. We are not an animal advocate group. We accept funds from animal ad advocate groups and individuals, but we would gladly accept funds from the American Physiology Society or WARF if uh, they offered to give us any. Our position is very straightforward. We reject the animal model as a predictive modality for humans while acknowledging their scientific viability in other areas. So our debate tonight focuses on predictability, so I'd like to take a moment and define that word. I looked up uh, various uh, definitions and various dictionaries and so on, and, and I thought this was a very uh, representative one. And I think I got this one from Wikipedia, actually. It says, a prediction is a statement or claim that a particular event will occur in the future in more certain terms than a forecast. In a scientific context, a prediction is a rigorous, often quantitative, and this is an important term to remember, statement forecasting what will happen under specific conditions typically expressed in the form, if A is true, then B will also be true. Now, outside the rigorous context of science, prediction is often confused with an informed guess or an opinion. Occasionally getting the right answer is not the same as predicting it. This is a little two-by-two two table that anybody who has ever studied statistics is uh, far more familiar with than they probably would like to be. And, but this is how we test a test. This is how we decide if the test actually does measure what it is we want it to measure. And this is, there's little math formulas that we can go through and we can calculate sensitivity and specificity and so forth. Tonight we're going to focus on positive predictive value since that's kind of what we're talking about. Now, before I get to the scientific evidence, I want to give you examples of how scientists who use animals use the word prediction. Now, this is from a toxicology textbook in, uh, in 2007. It says, biomedical science's use of animals as models is to help understand and predict responses in humans in toxicology and pharmacology. It goes on to say, by and large, animals have worked exceptionally well as predictive models for humans. Animals have been used for models for centuries to predict what chemicals and environmental factors would do to humans. The use of animals as predictors of potentially ill effects has grown since that time. If we correctly identify toxic agents using animals and other predictive model systems in advance, of a product or agent being introduced into the marketplace or environment, generally it will not be introduced. This is from a 2006 uh, cancer research journal. It says genetically, uh, genetically engineered mice closely recapitulate the human disease and are used to predict human response to a therapy, treatment, or radiation schedule. And finally, this is from the New York Academy of Science in 2003. It's uh, an abstract of a, a paper, and it says the failure in the clinic of at least 14 potential neuroprotective agents expected to aid in recovery from stroke after studies in animal models had predicted that they would be successful is examined in relation to principles of extrapolation of data from animals to humans. Now, all of these examples are viable ways that the word prediction is used in science. And I think this is very clear as, as to how these people use the word. 